Hello, I'm Oscar Crawford, and welcome to the Teaching Ministry of New Eden. This is Day 4 of Resurrection, the Revival of Black Men. These messages are presented in celebration of Black History Month 2013. You recall if you've been joining me on previous days that we began in Ezekiel chapter 37, where we find the bones of a dead army laying on the desert valley floor. God has sent a prophet and asked, can these bones live again? And the prophet said, God, only you know. God began to give instructions on what to say and what to do. And the bones began to reconnect. And tissue and muscle and fiber and systems began to reorganize inside those bones until there was flesh on those bones and that army stood up alive again. From there we went to Luke chapter 19 and we talked about a brother named Zacchaeus. Short black man, rich, rich, money, cash cake, the whole bit. And yet after an experience with Jesus, Zacchaeus would never be the same. He would begin to live for others and not just live for himself. He gave everything he owned to people he'd either wronged or to help people who were doing without things that are necessary for life. On yesterday, we talked about a brother who was a crazy black man, excommunicated, exiled from his family and community, and forced to live amongst the tombs. He would be tied to the stones, yet he would break them and he would scream through the night. But on an encounter with Jesus, things changed for him and he became delivered from the demons. We might call them deep psychological issues, but the Bible says demons. When he was delivered of his demons, he sat clothed and in his right mind, ready to go home and to love and to serve. All right, today we're going to be looking into the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, the New Testament book, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, and we're going to be talking about the conversion of an Ethiopian. All right, I'm going to read you the text, and then I'm going to pray. And the angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And when he was leaving Jerusalem and returning home, he was sitting on his chariot and he was reading from Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go and join yourself to the chariot. And Philip ran to the chariot and asked the brother reading Isaiah, do you understand what you are reading? And the Ethiopian said, how can I unless the learned one teach me about what I am reading? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him and consider what he was reading. The place of the scripture he read was this. He was like a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before the shearer, so he openeth not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, who are they talking about? This a, this a prophet or somebody else? And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What keepeth me from being baptized? And Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered, the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he demanded the chariot be stopped, and they went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and Philip baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, 
and the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. God bless the reading and the hearing of the word. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you thanks and praise for the privilege to do what you've called me to do, and the privilege to share what you've called me to share, and the privilege to be engaged with, with black men across North America and across the earth as we consider the things that are in front of us that would be walls and roadblocks and conflict. And, and, and we come uh, acknowledging all those things and trusting that you are going to help us regroup ourselves and regroup with each other so that we can become loving and functional and productive uh, in our own being, in our relationship with you, in our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with other folks. And uh, we just want to give you thanks and praise for the privilege to have faith for that. Today we talk about an impotent black man. Use me in such a way as that I can communicate clearly so it will be crystal, crystal, crystal clear to be understood. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so here's what we got. We have another rich black man. But I want to talk to you a bit from some extra biblical material that will help you understand how he arrived at his station of being the treasurer of the Candace of Ethiopia, and I need you to understand that the Candace of Ethiopia, as written in the scriptures, is not the Ethiopia that is a, a sovereign nation unto itself today. Ethiopia at the time was literally southern Egypt, and the Candace was the wife of the Pharaoh. You're not being taught that, I know, but go and do the research yourself. You'll find out that the title of the Pharaoh's wife was the Candace, and she had privilege to govern over southern Egypt literally identified in the text as Ethiopia. All right, and so she had her own treasure, but I want to talk to you about how the black man became her treasure. Now, please don't be excited about him being black, because everybody's black. Everybody at this period in time uh, is not Northern European. They're not from England and Scotland and Ireland and Germany. We're not talking about that. We're talking about North African and Middle Eastern people migrating west and then eventually north. Uh, but for now, we're talking about what would loosely be called people of color. I am saying to you that these people are black. Everybody in Egypt is not black. But there was once a time when everybody in Egypt was. All right. So, when we take a look at what's going on here, I need you to understand that people will do crazy things to escape poverty. You're aware of that. I mean, you've seen enough TV and watched enough movies to know that there are people who come from other countries, primarily European countries from the 20th century, but from others from the West Indies, the Caribbean, uh, from Africa, from Asia. People come to America to do all kinds of criminal things because people believe that there is opportunity here, both legit and illegit. But the brother that we're talking about, I mean, he was literally born in poverty in Egypt. He's born in poverty, and he's trying to do anything he can to escape poverty. And so there is an opportunity for him to escape his poverty. If he can win a competition sponsored by the Candace, it will help him not only leave poverty behind, but he thinks he'll be able to do good for his people. And he has other reasons for wanting to go. His father's a drunk. He's abusive and violent to his mother and his sister. And when he catches his father trying to abuse his sister in ways he should only be engaging with adult women, he says to him, if you ever do this again, I am going to take you wherever you're going to go because you're not going to live past that event again. Don't ever touch my sister like that again. This is extra biblical. You won't find it in the text. And so when he hears about the Candace's competition, it's running a gauntlet. And to run the gauntlet, it was almost impossible. People in their right mind would not have done it. But desperate people will take desperate measures. Are you listening to me? On the day of the competition, the queen, the Candace, her men, her armored men standing with swords and in their armor and got weapons, they stand on each side of a gauntlet and the person who can survive with no weapons no weapon formed against me shall prosper the person 
with no weapons who's willing to risk running the gauntlet if you can survive the gauntlet you're in you're in you have access to everything the queen has to offer 20 died running the gauntlet but the 20th one before he died gave our brother just enough information that if he could approach the gauntlet differently than he had he had an idea that if he would run the gauntlet this way he had a higher probability of success than all the others in front of him and so when it was his turn to run he took the advice of the man in front of him who had died and he successfully got through the gauntlet did he have cuts and scrapes yeah man he's going through where people got swords and those balls with the spikes on them and I mean yeah he, he came through he was injured but he was alive he had successfully survived the gauntlet he is now entitled to everything the Queen has in terms of opulent wealth because he's going to have a special role as her treasurer he's he has given example of his commitment to serve by being willing to run the impossible or do the impossible to escape the misery he's lived in and so now he's going to have everything available to him that the mind of a man can imagine just one little condition so what they tell the brother is look we're gonna give you 30 days go home put your business in order because you will not be able to go back home after this once you come inside the wall you don't get to go back where you come from you don't belong to that anymore you're a different level uh, you're gonna be living a different level of life and so uh, go home handle your business you know take some money take whatever you need fix up your folks just let them know that you love them you care about them you'll see that they're taken care of but you don't get to be there anymore and so he goes home for the 30 days and and he deposits some wealth in the hands of his family and and he reminds his father and look I don't even have to kill you myself now I can have you killed at the blink of my own eye treat my mother and my sister well he shows love to his sister and to his mother and even some level of respect for his father after having made himself very clear and after the 30 days he goes back to report and when he gets to the gate and announces who he is people are laughing at him and they're saying he's the one he's the one and they would laugh when they would say it they would snicker and say yep yeah, that's, that's the one they're going to they're going they're going to hook him up he's going to be the queen's treasurer he didn't really know what that's going to cost him yet and so when he arrived they set out this incredible feast celebration party boy can have any one woman in the kingdom that he wants or all that he can manage this night is his because on the morrow or tomorrow he starts his service to the Candace at the end of the night our brother is drugged and when he wakes up jokingly we might say he speaks in a higher voice his testicles have been removed he will no longer have the ability to reproduce himself think about this how many times have you seen in our culture brothers black men give up their ability to reproduce themselves to have access to power privilege and prestige would you do it let me tell you more black men more brothers would do this than I'm willing to admit there's just something intoxicating about wealth that people will almost do anything to acquire and to achieve and to have and I hope you are not one of them I'll be honest with you if I had been conscious enough to learn that they were gonna cut me as much as I love the privilege of being male I would have thanked them and run the gauntlet backward and killed everything I had to to preserve my ability to reproduce myself after all it is the one of the greatest gifts after life that has been given to us we can reproduce ourselves for successive generations because the seed of life is alive in us but if you ain't got no testicles to produce that seed you are something else and these people called him a eunuch years later after serving for a long time the Candace on her deathbed she goes to brother and says look I shouldn't have done to you what I did to you but that was the only way that we knew it was the way we do is the way we do business we not meaning to hurt you you paid the price you were willing but I feel bad about it now but one of the scrolls that we took one time in a conquest it talked about one who was going to be coming to Jerusalem 
who was going to be able to restore people by laying his hands on them, saying a word over them. He had miracles in his touch and his thoughts and his words. And I just believe that if you'll read this scroll written by a prophet named Isaiah, if you can get there in time to have this brother speak to your life, you can be restored. You'll be able to reproduce after all. Now, think about this. The way you read the text, it almost looks like this is a man out in a chariot, him in a chariot and a horse. This is a royal black man. This is a royal black man. He's not out here on his own. He has an entourage. There are people who are in charge of the chariot forces. There are security forces. He's probably got an entourage of 30 or 40 people accompanying him. This is no average guy. This is a person kind of like when you see Barack Obama be accompanied by Secret Service and all that caravan that is taking care of him. So don't, don't see this as some minimalist uh, picture where there's only a brother out here in a chariot by himself. No, no, no. This brother is opulently wealthy and backed up by a nation's treasury uh, and is the right hand to the Candace herself. And the Candace is dying. And she's given him a gift to go and literally she sent him to go see Jesus to give back to him what she took from him. The ability to reproduce. And so he goes and tragically he gets there too late. Jesus has already been executed. Resurrected, and we're going to get to that in a couple of days, but executed. And so on his way home he's still reading the scroll when... A teacher, a preacher shows up and says, you know what you're reading there? He says, no, how can I unless someone who knows teaches me? And in the dynamic encounter with what is spoken of in scripture about Jesus, this brother immediately wants to get to be in relationship with Jesus and all people who are in relationship with Jesus. And he wants to do it right then. Think about this. Look at what's happening here. God don't play. When God raised up a dead black army, did it like that. When God changed Zacchaeus, did it like that. When God changed the crazy black man in the cemetery, did it like that. And so this brother is acting on his immediate right now faith because he knows God alone can restore him. And so he says, what's keeping me from getting connected to this? And, and Philip the teacher said, nothing, if you believe. And he says, I do, and I want to be baptized too. Look, there's some water. And that's strange. You know, they're in the desert, but they say you look over and see some water. We'll just take it at its word because it says Philip baptized him. And then Philip vanishes. His job is done. And a eunuch goes on his way. I'd like to tell you the end of the story is of a brother sitting on the beach with his wife after numbers of years and their grandchildren are coming up saying Papa, Mama, y'all want to come play with us in the water? God has an uncanny ability from his invisible intangible existence to affect what happens to us in our life. If I took the time to tell you about how many times my life has been saved there's nothing in me to brag about the people's lives that I would say. God has saved my life more times than they say the cat has, more than nine times. I have the scars on my body to accompany those experiences, but I'm alive here now, 60 years old, to talk to you with some energy and some passion because I know my experience. I can't prove anything, but I can demonstrate with passion what I believe and show you the results of what I believe because I personally have had an encounter with God that has changed me. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. But I am conscious and alive and striving to live well and love well to be functional and productive and I invite you to allow yourself to be resurrected from miserable conditions back to life so we can do it together and what we do together where resurrected black men stand up arm in arm walking together walls divisions fall families reunite communities reunite nations reunite and a world can come together and be loving and productive across planet earth i want to live like that i hope you do resurrection the revival of black men this has been day four i hope you will join me again tomorrow where we take a look at I mean, we, when we get desperate, we'll do whatever we think we need to do. We'll talk about another poor black man who's begging at the curb of a rich man's estate just to have the crumbs that fall from his table. I'm Oscar Crawford. This is the teaching ministry of New Eden. 
celebration of Black History Month for 2013. Thank you for joining me. God bless you. God keep you. Until next time.